The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you might come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. In the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, there's an old saying by Mark Twain, which I'm sure many of you have heard, and it goes like this. Mark Twain said, it's not what we don't know that gets, it, gets us in trouble, but it's what we do know for sure that just ain't so. And in this, today's gospel, we see Thomas knowing something for sure that turns out to be just not so. And what he knows for sure is that dead people stay dead. Dead people don't rise again. And so when the disciples say that they've seen Jesus, he doesn't believe them. He basically says, I don't know who it is you think you saw, but it wasn't Jesus. Because if there's one thing I know, it's that dead people stay dead. So unless I put my hands in the holes in his hand, and unless I put my hand in the hole in his side, I'm not buying it. There's one thing I know, one thing I'm certain of, dead people stay dead. But as it turns out, what he thought he knew was wrong. This dead person, at least, Jesus, didn't stay dead. And that's the only thing that reasonably explains the change that occurred in this ragtag little, rag little group of scaredy cats, changing them into bold and courageous band of folks who went out with such a vigor and impact that they would change the world forever. And so if Thomas was wrong about this, if Thomas had this thing that he was certain about that turned out not to be true, it makes me wonder if there are things in my life, if there are things in our lives that we're certain of that may turn out not to be the case. And I'd like to suggest that there are actually a lot of these things. And many of them revolve around how we think about the good life. Many of the formulas, suggestions, principles, ideas about what makes for the good life are half-truths, myths, and outright lies told simply to sell us something. If you've ever found yourself saying, you know, I, I have more to do today than I could possibly get done, than I could ever get done. Ever heard anybody say that? Maybe ever said that once or twice yourself? Then, then chances are that you've bought into one of those lies about the good life. Because the good life is not a life in which you have more than you could possibly do. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, I am so stressed out? Maybe you've said that once or twice yourself. It's interesting 
Uh, when I was growing up, I don't ever remember, this is my old man moment, so thank you for, for <laughs> indulging me. But when I was growing up, I, I don't ever remember kids saying, I'm stressed out. I don't even remember teenagers saying it. I, I don't ever remember feeling stressed myself. It just wasn't how, how I approach life. But, but these days, I mean, I hear kids as young as five or six years old say, I am so stressed. Well, you know, if that's the case, if we really are feeling that stressed out from our youngest to our oldest, then, then you know, we, again, I'd like to suggest we're buying into some of these falsehoods about what the good life is. Because the good life surely is not a life where people are stressed out. Have you ever said, you know, I, I just, man, I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I, I've never felt so overwhelmed before. And, you know, I just feel like I'm overextended, overbooked, overcommitted. And sometimes we say that, we say that almost as a badge of how important we are. I have so much to do for so many people. I'm such a busy person. Look how important I am. And just think about that for a moment, what that says about us. I mean, is that really the good life? That we're so busy, that we have so much to do, that we're overwhelmed by it all? And so I want to suggest that all of these things are indications that in pursuing this life out there somewhere, uh, according to how people tell us it should be pursued, that those things actually don't turn out to be true. And the life that we end up living doesn't end up being a very good life at all. And, and, and so I'd like to just take the time remaining to consider uh, what one of those myths about the good life might be. And there's a whole bunch of them, and it would, I'd love to spend, talk about all of them, but we just don't have time to do that, and I'm trying to be good. Uh, so, uh, but, but the one that, um, that I, I want to focus on is sort of this myth that it's all good. And you'll sometimes hear people say that, hey, it's all good. Maybe you've said that. I've certainly said that uh, at certain points. And, there, there, and there's a way where that's true, you know, where people use that to sort of deal with stress. But there's another way where that's, where that's not true at all. And one of the ways that people use that, one of the things they often mean by that is, you know, it really doesn't matter what you do. It really doesn't matter what you do. It's all going to be okay in the end. It really doesn't matter what you choose, or what, what, what path you take. It, it'll all work out. It really doesn't matter what decision you make. Because, you know, in the long run, it all kind of comes to the same place. And, in the, and it's, it's all good. And so what happens is that every decision becomes the same. Everything uh, becomes equal. Nothing mat really matters more than anything else because it all takes the same place. It's, it's all good. And when everything's good, then we don't have a way of deciding what's really important and what's not. And everything begins to feel important. Everything begins to feel urgent. And when everything begins to feel urgent, uh, then we end up with this long list of things to do. And, and we just and we make whatever decision is available to us in the moment. You know, the way we approach that to-do list is we just start crossing things off. You know, I've got this list, I just hit them one at a time, just cross them off. And, 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 when, and, and so we approach it by making any decision that comes to us rather than taking the time, investing the energy, taking the trouble to make the best decision possible. You see, there's a world of difference between any decision will do as long as I'm crossing some things off my to-do list and making the very best decision we can. And whenever we settle for any decision other than the best decision, people will always suffer for it. Some way, shape, or form, people will always suffer for it. When we make any decision other than the best decision we can, we'll always get off track. Maybe just a little bit, but as we keep making decisions that are less than what they should be, we'll get further and further off track. And to the degree that the world is broken, and I think everybody admits that the world in some ways is broken. I mean, it's a beautiful world in many ways, but there's lots of things about it that are terribly and tragically broken. The way the world gets broken is one decision at a time, right? That's the way the world gets broken. So it, it's not all good. Our decisions really do matter. If, if you just did my job with me one day and saw the way that people suffer, saw the heartache, saw the grief, you would know that it's not all good. If you were to uh, sit with me, with somebody who's dying, who has come to their death with just a, a boatload of regrets, you'd know that everything isn't always okay in the end. Because it's not always okay in the end. And if you don't do the things ahead of time that you need to do, you know, to die well, then boy, that doesn't end up being a very pretty thing at all. 
And so when we come to approach all our decisions like everything's equal, that, that, that nothing's any more important than anything else, we end up with this to-do list that's as long as our arm. It has more on it than we'll ever be able to get done. And that's how we end up overextended, tired, weary, worn out, overwhelmed. Uh, and that's how we end up running on empty, feeling like we're running on empty. The way a lot of people approach life, it, it, it actually gets a little bit worse. I hate to say that, but it actually gets a little bit worse in this, is that um, the way that a lot of people approach life is that they see life like sort of juggling balls. And they think that that's how people live life well, is that it's a matter of uh, juggling. I had one more ball around here somewhere. Maybe it's in this. I don't know. Uh, well, I had three. But two will probably, oh, here's the third one, it's over here, okay. So, you know, if it's just one, you can juggle one, as long as you pay attention. Uh, if it's juggling two, you can probably juggle two, again, as long as you pay attention. If you stop paying attention, then you have a problem. And of course, once you get to three, you can sort of do it, if you sort of pay attention. And yeah, I did that for a minute, didn't I? That was pretty good, yeah, thank you, thank you. That went to my head, okay. Now. As long as these are just rubber balls, that's okay because when I drop them, they just bounce right back, right? So no big deal. You drop one in the juggling match. That doesn't really matter. It just bounces right back and you're okay and you just keep juggling them again. But what if life's not really like this? What if life is like, well, juggling eggs. If life is like juggling eggs, that might be a little bit more of a problem. Oh, I have enough in there, I think. A few extras here, just in case. I think you're okay there, you know. Uh, the first row, you might not be. But I think there, you're okay, so... So, if it comes to juggling eggs... <laughs> Thank you. Comes to juggling eggs, one's probably not too, probably not too bad, you know. If it's just one, that's probably okay. So, uh, uh, <laughs> why don't you stop paying? If it's two, all right. That didn't take long. If it's three, oop, oop. <laughs> it gets a little messy, doesn't it? And so, if life is more like eggs than it is like balls, like rubber balls, well, you know. Is it possible to break a relationship? Is it possible to break your health? Is it possible to break your integrity? Is it possible to break your finances? Is it possible to break your relationship with God? Not from God's perspective, but from our own it is, isn't it? God will always forgive us, God will always take us back, but from our side of things, we can do a pretty good job of messing that one up too, can't we? And so, if, you know, if life is more like, like eggs than like balls, well, this gets pretty messy, doesn't it? Anybody know anybody with any messes in their life right now? That's right. Uh, I'd suggest that life is actually more like this and like that. And if life is more like eggs than it is like balls, um, then, then what do we do about that? Well, if life is more like that, then you never want to juggle them in the first place, right? You never want to juggle them. What you want to do is you want to give each and everything that's important in your life the attention and care that it deserves, and then move on to the next thing and give it the care and attention that it deserves so you don't end up dropping and breaking anything. And what does that look like? Well, this happens to be one of the things on, in, in sort of the history of humanity and over the broad scope of humanity that there's amazing agreement. Anybody have a Kleenex by any chance to stretch of the, <laughs> any stretch of the imagination? Uh, I should have thought about that. Oh, look at that. You are well prepared. A whole box. You know me well. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right. Uh, but this is one of the things that there's amazing agreement about that. For as long as people have been around to talk about things, uh, you know, from... from Basically, you know, as long as people have been saying things, whether it was uh, whether it was way back in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, and it was people who were philosophizing, whether it was prophets in the Old Testament, whether it was Jesus in the New Testament, 
or whether it's people who are writing today, people who are writing books about top-notch business practices, people who are writing in the field of positive psychology, people who are writing about self-improvement, they all have said the same thing. And that same thing is, is the most important thing you can do is keep the most important thing the most important thing. Uh, it's so simple, isn't it? It's so obvious. We all know that the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. But as obvious as that is, we all have trouble with it, don't we? We all have trouble with it. And so we all need to be reminded the thing that life isn't like juggling rubber balls. It's like giving the things that are important in our life the attention and care that they deserve so that we don't break any of them. And the only way to do that is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And what does that look like? Well, again, this is something that there's been amazing agreement across the history of humanity, across the face of the globe, uh, every race, every culture, every tribe, uh, all um, amazing agreement about that. And what they virtually all say is that the most important thing in a person's life, because it's the foundation of everything else, and because it gives guidance in everything else, is a person's spiritual life. And though there are people in our day and age who say that the spiritual life isn't important because there is no spiritual life and there is no God, um, in, the, in the grand scope of the human family, across all time and all the world, that is a very, very small minority of voices. That's not to say they're not right. They might be. You know, minorities have been right before, so that's not to discount them. But it is to say that we would be at least equally foolish to discount all those other voices, the vast majority of voices down through time and across the whole wide world that says there is a God. And that our chief duty as human beings is to get to know that God and understand what He expects of us and live accordingly. And in some ways, you know, we think we're so clever. But in some ways, the ancients were wiser than we are. And, and, and just think about this for a moment. Up until about the 20th century, there was no plural for the word priority. Nobody ever would have talked about priorities. And it makes sense if you think about it. Because priority comes from the Latin word prior. And prior means first. And when it comes to first, it's just like the movie Highlander. There can be only one. Right? I'm glad you guys like that. Yeah, I was just... There can be only one. There's only one first. And, and so what that means is whether you believe in God or not, and this is why the ancients only had, you know, they, not even the ancients, not even that long ago, why they only talked about a priority. Everybody has a priority in their life. Whether you believe in God or not, there is something in your life that functions like God. And the only question is, if in the thing that, that's functioning as your God is going to do as good a job as God does. And my experience is that when people have something other than God functioning as God in their life, a functional God, that God is a cruel taskmaster and is going to be a very destructive force because that thing was never meant to be God. It can't bear the weight of God. It can't provide the foundation that God does. It can't give the kind of guidance that God does. And so, again, the vast majority of people, myself certainly included, would say the single most important thing you can do, the most important thing, keeping the important thing the important thing, is to start with your relationship with God. And that's why of all the things we ask you to do at St. Matthew's, and you know, we ask you to do a variety of things. We say, we'd love for everybody to go on a mission trip. Somewhere along the line, part of our dream for each and every one of you is that you go on a mission trip. We say, we'd love for all of you to be involved in a small group. Part of our dream for each and every one of you is that you would be involved in a small group. We say that we'd like everybody to be involved in some way in service. That just uh, like we build other things into our week, that we would build serving others into our week. We say that we hope that everybody would be increasingly generous from year to year that we would give more of what we have, a greater percentage of what we have away, as our hearts get more and more generous. But more than I would want any of those things for you, the number one thing that I would want for you is for you to start your day by saying a simple prayer, something like this, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do? You don't have to use those words. Use whatever words are comfortable for you. But in praying that prayer, get clear 
about what the most important thing is. And then do it. And then do it. And I would say that after God comes our relationships, family, friends. After that comes our health. After that comes our job. And our job doesn't come to that. And if you get these things backwards and out of place, then these, then these, you know, these things that can be so good actually become quite destructive. And, and, and I can show you that, not, not from a Christian perspective, but we can go out the, a, a wide variety of disciplines that will show you when you get this stuff out of order, it's just not good for people. And, uh, and then the last one I would say after work is our finances. And the reason they go in that order, spiritual life, uh, relationships, family and friends, health, job, and then finances, is they all build on each other. Each one builds on each other. As they build on each other, that's what really creates a good life. What does that look like? Well, one last story and we're done. I learned this week of a parishioner. I did not know this until just this week, and it was his mother who was, uh, who was telling me this. But uh, we have a parishioner whose father has Alzheimer's. His father's a relatively young man uh, and has just been put into an Alzheimer's ward. And he, this ward is about an hour and a half from here. So a pretty good drive. And this, this young guy is like you. He's an important guy who's got lots to do, places to go, people to meet. Uh, and really, he, he does. Uh, but every single week on Tuesdays, he drives an hour and a half down to see his dad. Spends the morning with his dad, who doesn't even remember he was there, and then drives an hour and a half back. How does he find the time to do that? He doesn't find the time to do that. He makes the time to do that. You will never find the time for what's important, because it's not there. You have to make the time for what's important whether it's being here this morning, whether it's being present to those you love, whether it's taking care of yourself physically, whether it's doing a good job, whether it's managing your finances well. The things that are important, you don't find the time for those things, you make the time. And when you do, you can let everything else go. And instead of being hectic and harried and worn out, and overwhelmed and feeling like we're running on empty. We'll have the assurance that we're getting life right and that we're living life well and that what we found is the real good life, not just somebody else's version of it who wants to sell us something. Amen. Amen.